Uh, all right, well, hello everyone, and welcome to the Osim Punker podcast. Um, it is uh, I forget which episode. Here's the thing. Here's a note for editor technical Season four, episode eight. That, that a note that I'm going to completely ignore into the future while I'm editing this, but it's season four, episode eight. Awesome. Nice. All right. So what are we going to talk about this week? I, I know John sent me over like a Google Doc length, you know, thing about topics. And, and I was I was specifically instructed not to touch Ukraine for the first 45 minutes. Like, I was I was actually given instructions not to. Um, yeah, honestly, so folks, I it's think... a nightmare trying to keep him away from talking about Ukraine. Yeah, last yeah, last yeah, episode, yeah, yeah. I wasn't here, and he spent the entire episode talking about Ukraine, even though I asked him to talk about other things. So Well, you weren't, you weren't there to fix it, so... Well, exactly, huh. so I'm here now. All right, well, we're going to touch on the Middle East, and oh, of course, because because we get to talk about the Middle East and Iran, I guess we also get to pivot about certain Iranian weapons shipments to Russia as well, so Honestly. you can't just I found his channel for that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so I think we'll just start on general Middle East stuff. I'll let you lead us off, John, on that. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're lucky this week to have with us uh, Aleph, um, who is becoming quite a regular guest on the podcast um, and is very much uh, uh, an expert on most things Middle East. Um, and I know, Aleph, speaking to you earlier, you, you're particularly keen to talk about uh, goings on in Iraq at the minute and then uh, maybe also about the sort of Israel-Lebanon deal uh, that was signed last week. Um, so if you want to kick us off, mate. Yeah, of course. Uh, I guess you forgot uh, the Iran as well. So I'm going to have a brief on Iraq and the deal between Lebanon and Israel about the maritime deal. And then I'll have a little bit longer talk about Iran. So here we go. Uh, in the past weeks, uh, uh, there was a new president in uh, Iraq. And the guy is pretty much uh, carrying the positive votes of the militia groups, uh, including the Iranian-backed groups. Mm -hmm. And the guys, uh, basically, uh, the opposition side and Muqtada Sadr are not happy with what's going on with this president. And of course, the prime, the new prime minister, then the, the, uh, he's actually a nominee so far, and there would be. Uh, voting in the uh, parliament the Majlis Nawab during the next week. Wait, you're uh, telling me that Sadr is angry at the current Iraqi government? Uh, it's, it's a, a new one, surprise. yeah. <laughs> no, I know. He's angry. He's been angry at every Iraqi government since, well, pretty much forever. Yeah, but, uh, you know, Rashid, the Abdul uh, Latif Rashid is the uh, new uh, president, and he's quite pro-Iran. And the new, uh, uh, I, I won't say yeah. an administration, but the new government, all of them met the Iranian uh, ambassador to Iraq first before meeting anyone else. So this is a clear message that the Iranian regime is behind the uh, next and the nominee government as well. Sadr is... Uh, Sadr swore that he is not going to participate, and he said we don't uh, agree with this government. We are not uh, getting involved in join in forming the government, and so on. So, this is the current situation in Iraq. You know, we will know about the Sudani. Uh, you know, uh, Sudan is also pro-Iran very much, and uh, I believe that they will get the uh votes for forming the new government so i don't think that would be an issue for them so uh highly likely the new government in iraq we would know by the next week uh the the new government in iraq will be a completely pro-iran an iran-backed government which is not a good news for well the countries that don't like the current regime in iran yeah, though at the same time, I think Sadr sort of boycotting the entire process has been 
a, a bit of an accelerationary move um, in order to kind of push his sort of alliance against Iranian influence in Iraq against um, the groups yeah. that are pro-Iran who are currently now in the government. Um, and so we could see that sort of evolve into the near future into... Um, I wouldn't just, you know, blatantly say more violence, but it, it is one of those things where you could see that sort of occurring. Yeah, correct. But, uh, you know, the uh, new president and the new prime minister don't have uh, very bright uh, histories. And, uh, you know, the Rashid uh, was a member of KDP and the UK, and he quit both of the groups and parties, and he met the Iranian ambassador, as I mentioned earlier, uh, also, Sudani was a member of the uh, Hezbe Dava, the, the Dava party. His dad was also a member of Hezbe Dava, and his dad was ha uh, was uh, executed by Saddam Hussein in 1980s. I think it was 1980. So, uh, uh, I believe Sadr is right at the moment, because uh, this government smells like Iran. I mean, this is far from being an Iraqi and an independent uh, government, and the president as well. So uh yeah it it's pretty much what the militia groups wanted so far yeah and i don't think that Sadr would a would be able to stop them whatsoever because he doesn't have the majority and i think it's over for this round we'll see by the well, next saturday i guess i'm not sure about the, the voting date but i think it's on saturday yeah there always is the risk based on the rhetoric um that we could see things sort of escalate um, outside of just the political arena, obviously. Um, we have seen protests in Baghdad. Baghdad is really a hot spot um, for the pro satirist movement. Um, I mean, Sadr City and, and sort of those surrounding areas. Um, and, and again, the urban core as well of Baghdad um, sort of has a lot of not allegiance per se and i'll say that not necessarily x per se for a lot of things here because i don't want to make sweeping generalizations because when it comes to iraq everything especially once it comes to sectarian lines gets really blurry because you know there's sectarianism there's nationalism there's sort of a lot of these elements um but baghdad in and of itself being sort of this hotbed of of pro Sadr sentiment um could lead to things escalating um if if there were some level of violence or some level of protests uh yeah i believe so because uh i think that sadr will be uh actually he might provoke some some of his followers he ha which has uh uh you know the sorry uh, the sorry al salam uh, they they have lots of members and they follow and uh, maybe I can. It's not safe to say that they worship Sadr, but they they're really loyal to Sadr, and yeah. they can actually start another round of protests uh, in Baghdad, in uh, Najaf, especially Najaf, because that's his base. Yeah, and yeah, things can can lead uh, to well worse days for Iraq. Yeah, uh, so far. I mean, we have to wait for the uh, Majlis Nawab results and let's see if the Sudani gets the uh you know gets the proper positive votes if so i believe that yes Sadr will start something pretty much big uh which and also i believe that he's uh, he's quite capable of uh doing such thing because uh you know the he has the militias he has proper politicians following him and well, at the same time, this uh, Sistani is not doing anything, not, not talking about anything right now, so he's not taking any political sides. So I believe this is just Seder and some small Sunni uh, uh, parties against the whole Iranian-backed uh, alliance. Yeah, and that, that is one thing the Iranians do have, or the, the Iranian-backed alliance in um in Iraq has that, you know, massive amount of Iranian backing, but it also has the sort of self-contained security infrastructure of the PMUs. Um, they, they, they kind of have their own army. And of course they have Iran um, sitting right over the border, ready to, in effect, and as they've shown, um, be willing to assist with both material, potentially strikes, um, and, uh -huh. and just this, 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 
very kinetic amount of support or, or, or a very large amount of support. Yeah, actually, that is true. Because uh, right now, as we are speaking right now, October 18th, if, I, if, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, and, uh, you know, uh, the Iranian regime uh, uh, so far in the past recent weeks uh, targeted lots of Iraqi, Kurdistani Iraqi uh, areas, and they're sending a message to the KDP and to the Barzani family that uh, if you're not in our favor, we can do bigger and worse than what we did before and what we did in the past recent weeks. So uh, I believe that Iran is pressurizing the Kurdistani parts and parties to, uh, well, break some bread with them. Uh, I, and I believe that would happen because they are talking uh, like two days ago, one of the IRGC commanders said that uh, if, if necessary, we will attack the uh, Kurdistani terrorist uh, uh, parties, they, they were talking about the PKK or PKK, and uh, well, they're still threatening the Iraqi Kurdistan, and well, I believe that it's kind of working so far. Yeah, well, and, and there is also that implicit level of protection that the Iranians could also offer to them, um, especially against Turkey as well. Uh, yeah, I don't believe... Uh, uh, that would happen because, you know, uh, the both Iranian and the Turkish government and uh, the Iranian regime, actually, they both of them claim that they are against the uh, PKK. And lots of the times they had cooperations and operations, joint operations to target uh, PKK, uh, uh, you know, targets, positions, uh, sometimes civilian areas. Just to, I don't know, I believe this is not something proper and this is something quite brutal. And I believe that the PKK attack, attacks on the Kurdistani areas and claiming that we are targeting terrorists is quite a nothing but an excuse. So I believe yeah, that well, Iran uh, and, and Turkey won't really confront each other on that front uh, against the Kurdish uh, parties and Kurdish uh Separatists, the Kurdistani, Iraqi, the uh, Syrian Kurds, and so on and so on. Yeah, though, uh, again, those PKK territorial claims do present both a threat to um, the Iranian and Turkish government, um, where that, 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 that area would both um, sort of involve their territories. Um, so yeah, there, there definitely is that, that level of, of threat, and, and may drive... Um, the regular Kurdish parties as well, who have, you know, received a fair amount of independence or independent governance since 2003 in northern Iraq, um, which has kind of given them that level of uh, of of established independence, basically, that I don't think they want to give up anytime soon. Yeah, true that. But uh, most of the time, uh, it's not PKK. It's, it's really not. And I actually, I'm in contact with Kurdistani, Iraqis, with Syrians, and, you know, uh, they also denounce the PKK. But the problem is the the PKK is just an excuse, especially for the Iranian regime, uh, for uh, doing whatever the hell they want. Uh, am I allowed to swear? Okay, you can't delete this part. Uh, and <laughs> you are... <laughs> so, uh, you know... Uh, the, you know that during the, I think it was two weeks ago, they attacked a school. Lots of people died. Lots of people got injured, and you can't like, uh, you can't find a better excuse uh, than PKK, and you say, yeah, that was a misfire or something like that, which they they, they didn't even uh, admit that. So they just said we targeted terrorists. And we saw there were civilians around them. Like, uh, children got scared, ran away from the scene. <clears throat> Lots of things that the Iranian is uh, doing, not just in Iraq, but in Syria, in Yemen. And it's still happening. So uh, I believe, uh, uh, well, that's also a leverage for the Iranian regime and also a bargaining, uh, bargaining chip for the Iranian regime. And it's still goes, uh, going on as long as the regime exists, as long as the Iranian regime has the missile and the drone power, and also the insiders, the militias inside the uh, the Iraq, 
it still goes on. I don't think it would uh, be stopped by the Iranian regime unless someone stopped the regime. Yeah, well, uh, uh, and I I don't know if how much we want to go into it, new subjects because I John's gonna yell at me if I start mentioning Ukraine. Um, but the Iranian regime sort of has de- or shown a willingness, um, to act much more in an international capacity over the past few years. Um, obvious or you know past ten years, heavy support of. Hezbollah and and groups in Syria and um and and Iraq um and also more official agreements as well um with states like or I I think we can call Russia a rogue state at this point because they're making nuclear threats um but you know that that giving or or donating or actually no one really knows what they're being supplied with but so you know supplying Russia with um a, a multitude of of weapon systems um and so i definitely think they've they've established this willingness to to act in that nature especially under the the current leadership um Raisi has or, or or seems to be much more willing to to take those bigger steps um in acting on an international stage frankly i don't uh, you know the, as as someone who was born in iran i can tell you that in the whole country nothing changes by the government all of the things that are being passed by the parliament or as they say majlis <clears throat> they are being approved by the uh, council of guardians who are also uh, selected by the supreme leader by by Khamenei so uh, whatever is being passed or being rejected whatever is going on in Iran is directly uh, under control of Khamenei the supreme leader of Iranian regime and He's responsible for whatever is happening by the Iranian regime, including the export of the um, Shahed 136 uh, UAVs that you're seeing every day. You're posting them on your Twitter. I'm not following Ukraine. I stopped following Ukraine after a while. But uh, we're seeing that, and there are rumors that they are going to export uh, 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 Fateh 110 and uh, Zolfagar uh, I think BMs. So. I think the Reuters article basically confirmed that they were going to export them in the next couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, it's likely because we see, uh, you know, the frequent flights by the EPPUS aircraft by Puya Air, which is directly under control of the IRGC uh, Kuts, the foreign part of the IRGC. So I think it's quite possible. Uh, and also they have quite... Uh, uh, enough logistical, uh, I don't know, trucks and transportation uh, hubs to deliver them to Russia uh, through the land as well. So I believe that would happen as well. When when the United States uh, predicted that they are going to uh, provide the Russian regime, the uh, Putin's regime, uh, with the uh, UAVs, well. Lots of people didn't believe, and now we're seeing it, it's happening every day in Kiev, in Kharkiv, in lots of areas. So it's not something that is unlikely, and the BMs are, you know, I, I personally don't underestimate the Iranian uh, military capabilities, especially about the BMs, uh, more especially about the MRBMs and SRBMs and the UAVs. Uh, they proved themselves again against the Saudi Arabia, against the UA, uh, UAE. Uh, in Iraq, uh, they're proven, and now they're proving themselves in uh, Ukraine. And there's no proper. I don't want to enter the enter the topic that I'm not supposed to talk about. But we're seeing that every day. They they are doing that, and there's no proper air defense systems for uh, stopping this at this moment, especially when they are launching them in bulk and like 10, 15. Uh, I'm not following uh, like precisely, but we can see that how many of them are you going to? And also, they are their suicide drones. They are not that as expensive as other risks that uh, Russia could take, like uh, using the aircraft. And they're working. Then they're targeting civilians, and they're still working for a Russian favor. And that's it. Yeah, and I think it does sort of lead us into at least a preview of what uh, another Gulf conflict would look like. Um, 
just with that very heavy Iranian emphasis on that the the low cost, high impact type of warfare um, that you know their their drones provide. And, you know, obviously Iranian drones have been a subject in the general defense community for a while with many people saying, oh, the threat is overhyped. Other people saying the threat is underhyped. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do think this conflict gives us sort of an idea of, of what that would look like, um, of, of those capabilities being pretty hard to knock down, especially when they're aimed at civilian targets as well. Um that becomes mm -hmm. somewhat difficult again to to just provide that area defense um and I, I i do think that is a significant risk moving into the future the iranians could absolutely um shut down the strait of hormuz without that much investment um to be honest uh just with their current capabilities and so you know that that definitely is a risk um yeah definitely it is that's why i uh I think that I, I'm I'm not very good at economics, but uh, that's why I, I guess that is why the Saudi Arabia is siding with Moscow at the moment. Uh, even though that it's siding with its nemesis, the Iranian regime, and well, because uh, something very big is at the stake, and I don't believe that they can risk it at the moment. The, the Saudi government they can't risk it right now, and yes, the the uh, Hormuz Strait, even being closed for one day, it would be a very huge loss for the oil industry. And well, so far they they're, they they've stopped. But the, there's also another factor that the the Saudi and the Houthis, uh, the uh, the Iranian-backed Houthis, uh, they stopped and they didn't renew the new uh, the the previous truce. And well. The clashes have have begun again in several areas in Yemen. Apparently, the I I personally believe that this is an that is a direct order by the Iranian regime to well get uh, involved in different uh, fronts. To uh, personally, I believe to to just uh, uh, you know distract the whole. Uh, world from what's happening right now in Iran, which is which uh, which is a subject that I'm going to talk about after we're done here. Yeah, and and I I I do think there are a lot of questions. I think as we've both said, um, and a lot of kind of gaming it out that still needs to be done. Um, the events in Ukraine have definitely given us some clarity on that where um, the capabilities have been somewhat revealed or sort of the the difficulties have, have been revealed in, in actually countering threats like this. Um, though the broader geopolitical situation, as you said, is, is still kind of hazy um, uh, uh, with obviously the Saudis and the Iranians. And of course now the Russians taking an, I think, unintended larger position in the region. Um, uh, just due to their sort of stuck conflict in Ukraine, um, where, you know, that, that is affecting the region. And, and just obviously grain exports have been a big issue um, for, for a lot of countries, especially Lebanon. Um, maybe, I wouldn't say Syria as much because they may have profited a bit from this, just in general, stolen grain shipments. Um but I, I definitely think we're at that point where we're we're kind of seeing this this Ukraine conflict sort of balloon out. And I, I, I know we've been talking about this for a while about, you know, events one place can cause many unintended consequences all over the world. Um, that that continues to hold true. That's that's basically, you know, the reality of today. Um, but we definitely are seeing sort of an event in Ukraine affecting the, the Middle East in, 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 as a whole. Yeah, just like the uh, the rest of the world, actually, I'm right now in in a uh, Middle Eastern country, I'm in Turkey, and uh, people are seeing that uh, like pretty much closely because uh, everything got affected here in lots of other countries in the European countries. Uh, well, this the whole Ukraine thing is not something that anyone can ignore right now because it's affecting all of us as normal humans, not as someone who's talking on a podcast or anything. And I believe that uh, 
yeah, of course, we have to pay enough attention. And, you know, I, I believe that, uh, you know, I'm not in a position to talk about Ukraine here. I, I really don't want to. But we all know that if if Ukraine is done, Russia won't be, uh, won't stop at uh, Ukraine. We all know that. And it's, it's something that's, uh, that is, uh, maybe that is why the NATO and uh, lots of nations are trying to stop Russia from, well, advancing towards the Western side. Yeah, and, you know, there obviously is, a, there are a lot of those considerations. Um, again, global society, global, global in, or, or global effects for, for any, uh, any circumstances. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll continue to see that evolve. That's, that's, that's what it is. And, um, yeah, I think we'll con continue to see that relationship in the region evolve as well. Sure thing. Uh, so if I may, I'm going to talk about the Iranian, uh, current round of protests, uh, and we can go. I, actually, this is a long one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you take the lead on that one. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the whole uh, the whole story uh, actually started from arresting a girl called Masa Amini. She was in her twenties and she was arrested by the morality police, which is responsible for uh, basically arresting uh, women and even men who are not uh, under the uh, what they call the Islamic standards, and they, uh, well, they arrested Masa Amini on, on uh, uh, 16th uh, September, and, well, she passed away in the, in the office of, not passed away, actually, she passed out in the office of the, the headquarters of the morality police. She was transferred to Kesra Hospital in Argentina Square in Tehran, she passed away after two days, unfortunately, and the Iranian regime made lots of things. Uh, we saw, uh, well, hacking groups. Uh, they claimed that we uh, we obtained uh, the CT scan results and there were uh, fractures on her skull. Well, and the whole story started from there. The Iranian regime made some. Uh, I, I I wouldn't. Uh, call it a fake, but it was a very uh, short video that was cut several times and no one knows what happened to myself and uh, she was in the headquarters of the uh, morality police or as they say, uh, the headquarters is in Persian, they call it police uh, amniyata akhlaqi or gashter uh, shot briefly, which means the patrol of uh, I don't know, something like a sharia uh you know advice something like that <clears throat> but uh well uh, some uh some some uh girl who was with maso uh in the same one they said that she said that uh maso was holding her head in the in the uh, police's van and uh she wasn't feeling good apparently her head was uh I hit somehow. Uh, well, it's still quite unclear as of now, but the <clears throat> denials by the Iranian regime, I think it, you know, uh, judging by the previous denials by the Iranian regime, like the PS752 that they shoot down on uh, January 2020, the denials by the Iranian regime won't be accepted, especially by the Iranians. But there are still some European nations that they are still believing when an official source denies something, they still accept that. But for Iranian regime, <clears throat> when they deny something, the the ins, uh, the people who are living inside Iran, they know and they believe that uh, the, the reality is quite the opposite of what the Iranian regime denied. So about the mass, the same thing happened. And two days after that, on uh, September 18th, uh, or September 17th, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, she passed away in Kesra Hospital. They announced her death, unfortunately. And, uh, well, 
uh, one thing led to another one. The when she when they were uh, burying her in Sapa city in Kurdistan province of Iran, which is in western Iran, uh, there were some small protests, and well, the Iranian regime wasn't uh, tolerating what's uh, what was people uh, uh, what were people demanding, and they. Uh, as uh, just as usual and as as always, they uh, confront confronted the protests and, and very peaceful protests with violence and well, it spread uh, it got spread uh, all around Iran. So they started the filtering, the internet uh, blocking. Still, as 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 of now, as I'm talking right now, which is uh, eighteen thirty five October. Uh, uh, 18, 2022, there are lots of people who are experiencing serious problems for accessing the internet, especially the uh, cellular internet on three major providers, Rytel, uh, MCI or Hamra Aval and Hirocell. So the Iranian regime got the uh, internet blocked, started uh, bad denials, made some uh you know forced confessions by the fa families uh of those who were killed during the protests not just massa uh massa's family but well lots of other people including the the people who are becoming uh like the symbols of the protests and what people are right now sh chanting in the streets of Tehran Mashhad uh Shiraz uh Rash uh, Tabriz, uh, Isfahan, lots of cities. They they are chanting right now. They're chanting, "This is not a this is not a protest. This is a revolution." And so, uh, the Iranian regime doesn't want to uh, back down, and they, uh, you know, as always, as, as what we saw on November two thousand nineteen, as Iranians say, and Same thing happened. They killed. But what is believed uh, is 1,500, the amnesty, which I have zero respect for them. They said that it's, it was about 300, but uh, well, we have names. Lots of people have the names. And uh, right now, same thing is happening in Iran. Lots of people were killed in, if I remember correctly, in Ermia or Urmia, as they say. Uh, one kid... I'm, I'm not kidding. One, one kid, 16 years old boy, got killed after he was shot by the, uh, uh, you know, by the uh, rubber bullets, and they took his uh, uh, body. The parents took his, uh, the parents uh, took him to to their house in fear of the security forces because they are occupying all of the hospitals right now uh, in order to check who was shot by the security forces. And after they got, uh, like. Better they they arrest them and uh, transfer them to the security prisons and jails. So they took him uh, home, and well, he passed away there. Uh, I'm sorry, not not there actually. They they came to his house, took him again, and brought his dead body back in 48 in less than 48 hours. Uh, and they said, and the the irony of this, I'm sorry for saying irony. I'm I'm, I'm sorry. I'm I'm pretty much uh furious about this this whole thing not just one particular person but they said that he was beaten by a rabbit dog and he he, he passed away because uh, the, uh, uh his parents didn't uh want to continue the procedure for for uh for the uh, for the medical procedure and this this is quite the opposite of what happened in reality it's not just her it's the hadith najafi the girl was shot six times twice in the head the hands the chest someone who was just uh, just protesting quite peacefully i'm not talking about the protesters who are using the uh i believe that right uh, those are also rightful against someone who's shooting at you uh, multiple cocktails and stones but uh, someone like hadith was quite normal a, a very uh quiet girl or uh, lots of other people. Another girl was killed. 
16 years old she what she wanted was just uh, very basic things of freedom and well she was suppressed and unfortunately in, in that case she was killed and no one is stopping uh, this regime from doing that no one is uh, uh, doing a proper condemnation they just say oh this is bad I believe this is not something that, uh, you know, uh, you know, right now you're seeing what's, what's the, uh, what is the Iranian regime uh, capability. They are, they're targeting civilians in Ukraine with the Iranian uh, UAVs. So that's the same thing is also happening in Iran. And the difference is that the Iranian people don't have internet right now. Every day there are outages from, as far as I know, from 4 p.m. to 12 uh, like the, the the midnight, they cut the whole internet access for everyone. The VPNs are not accessible, uh, and well, the the services that the uh, providers who are providing uh, web servers in uh, Iran, the Iran-based servers, they are threatening the customers that if you're using this as a proxy, as a middleman proxy, there will be legal consequences. So there is no voice of them, uh, and well, the uh, people, I believe personally, that they they reach the conclusion uh, in many cities, in many different uh, levels of culture, levels of life. They right now they they are not relying on the international community anymore. I'm talking about what happened on 2019. They call it. Uh, uh, the, the Iranian date is uh, uh, 1388 uh, in Persian. Well, people got killed back then. Well, that was over a uh, presidential elections. But right now, and on back on November uh, 2019, uh, well, it, this is not over a presidential election or someone who you of don't want to be your president anymore right now we are hearing in the streets in front of women that even women they they are swearing at Khamenei directly this this is pretty much different than, than what happened in 2009 and before than that right now they are uh there are chants that i, I can't even mention them and women and men are are chanting big this is the 43 years of anger that iranian people are shouting in the streets and they are they know that they don't get any support not from the u.s government not from i'm not talking about this particular government even the trump government anyone they there there are there's literally zero support for the iranian people just just imagine that if uh ukraine was alone but this is worse this this regime is way worse because the you don't see the Russian government killing thousands of its own people. Well, except sending them to the battlefield stupidly and killing them. But imagine you are holding a sign in the street and an A4, a letter in the street, and you get shot because of uh, just expressing uh, your emotions, expressing your idea about this dictatorship. I I call it loudly. This is a this is an Islamic uh, dictatorship. Even the most Islamic countries in the world right now at this moment, none of them are forcing people to be Islamic. And lots of people, including me, as an Iranian born, I have the right to say that this is uh, you know I'm uh, I'm not a religious person. I don't believe in any religion, but I believe that this is not even the whole thing about the uh, religious thing. They are uh, trying to distract people with uh, things like Islamic uh, practices in order to do what they are doing, like the uh, the money laundering they are doing, the uh, drug trafficking through the Middle East towards the South, uh, uh, towards the uh, Africa and then South America. Uh, there are claims that uh, the Iranian regime and the Hezbollah from Lebanon are uh, trafficking huge and untalkable amounts of drugs to South America through Venezuela, which is also, you know, that the current president of them, the, uh, what was his name, Guaido, the Juan Guaido guy, 
they're involved in the whole thing. Uh, this is a network, so the Iranian regime tries to distract the whole, the, 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 its own people uh, to just uh, do whatever the hell it wants, and it won't stop. It won't stop as long as uh, the the time exists and you and I exist, unless it gets stopped. And uh, back, going back to the uh, previous case, you know, right now the Iranians are not asking anyone, the Americans, the Europeans, not no one, literally no one, that they don't need their help right now. Because they they demanded the help in 2009. They demanded the help. They asked for help for not not a military thing, just just free internet by any uh, possible way. Well, right now we are seeing the uh, the uh, actually free internet by the uh, Starlink uh, dishes in Ukraine, but even that is inaccessible in Iran. So. They're trying to, uh, the, the recent news that I got was that uh, there are some smugglers who smuggled the dishes and they're uh, selling it in uh, from something between 40 million tomans to 60 million tomans. Something uh, basically between $1,200 uh, up to nearly $2,000 per dish without any subscription or anything right now. Because they just want to send uh, the send, uh and and you know inform the uh, people outside of where they're living that what's going on in, in the country right and we are uh, 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 just just let's pass through the talking about the community and thing there are different and uh, and serious changes in the way that i'm seeing uh well i, I was uh, monitoring the uh protest since the first since the very first day actually uh I was checking the location, geolocating the uh, areas and blah, 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 uh, preparing maps and so on. <laughs> Judging by the videos and pictures that I'm seeing right now, uh, this is quite different. I am not sure that this is going to be a successful one or not. Uh, I, I, I'm not inside Iran, so I can't judge, I can't predict. But what I'm seeing right now is quite different than, than what happened in 2019 at least. And of course, before than that, like 2009, people are defending themselves. They are not, uh, yeah, there are cases and there are videos, but people are, right now, people are defending themselves. People are standing against the uh, the uh, thugs, the police forces, the Basiji forces, the IRGC forces, and the uh, intelligence forces who are, who are uh, running and uh, uh, driving towards them, they are standing. They are not like before. They are defending themselves. They are preparing multiple of cocktails. They are using uh, lots of methods of the, uh, you know, uh, the social uh, disobediences, closing their stores, going on strike, uh, universities, uh, students, and so on and so on. And we can see that on, in the field as well, they are preparing uh, multiple of cocktails. They are using handguns that they obtained no uh, no one knows how uh, but I, I saw a picture last yesterday in Naziabad which is a neighborhood in southern Tehran they obtained two pistols after kicking uh, two police officers asses so they, they are trying to defend themselves this is not the time for them to uh, stand against uh, all of the, the oppression, uh, I'm sorry, it's standing silence against the uh, oppression. And right now they are trying to defend themselves by all means and by however they can. Even the uh, kids, the teenagers who are 14, 13, 15 in the schools, they are shouting death to Khomeini. They are ripping the pictures of Khomeini apart. They are trying their best. And I really uh, respect what they're doing, but like uh let's put put uh, let's put the emotions aside uh, right now the iranian regime is in a very tight position if there is in no jcpo a2 there is no uh, nuclear deal as they like briefly say there is no nuclear do uh, nu nuclear deal uh, uh two well uh, they're uh, they're pretty much in a very bad swamp because uh well 
the economy right now is at, at its worst. The dollar is about 34,000 tomans or 340,000 reals. Uh, pretty much everything is going towards the swap and well i hope they uh make it themselves but uh, i believe that even uh if this round of protest don't go anywhere if again if i believe that people learned how to defend themselves and learned how to move forwards and uh, shout and scream their demands and uh, well what i'm feeling right now that they are lacking a proper uh target right now they are in the streets but uh, the regime doesn't give a shit about the streets right now i'm sorry for swearing uh the regime you can't remix it the regime doesn't give a single uh heck about the screams uh the, about the streets i'm sorry uh so I believe that this needs to be uh, led and, um, you know, uh, heading towards somewhere, getting and capturing places like uh, IRAB, the, what they call Sedao the, uh, the broadcast, the National Broadcasting Center in Tehran, the Valley, a street, they call it Jama Jam. And, well, uh, further places, the Khamenei's office, the presidential palace and the IRGC places. Uh, right now, I believe that this is a very strong message to the world, as we are hearing some networks who are not doing anything and who were not doing anything for at least a month. Now they started talking about it because th this is something that can't be ignored. And well, uh, even the Iranian regime's lobbies in Washington are, st are, are started talking about it because they they are they are sensing that this time it's different and well uh they can't just justify and whitewash what, what is the iranian regime doing right now in the, uh, the in in the territory of iran well uh i believe that uh this round uh is uh quite positive in favor of the iranian people not the iranian regime and its own people but i believe that uh people are starting to learn how to defend themselves how to go for what's uh best what's best for them at this point they just need a few tips they just need a few uh leaders even in, i'm not talking about outside leaders i'm not talking about make group or uh, the 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 prince in exile uh I, i'm generally talking and generally speaking that they need to uh, find their proper leaders or at least find the, their proper instructions for uh, facing the regime and uh, going for what, what is valuable for their regime. So we, we are seeing in Abadan, in Asaluya cities, in the southern part of Iran, in uh, Khuzestan and Bushehr provinces, the workers of the, uh, you know, uh, the refineries, they are going on strike. And this is a very huge damage, especially financially damage for the Iranian regime. Uh, I believe that if this continues for one or two more months, uh, it will find its way to overthrow the regime. And uh, even if not, if it doesn't, uh, I believe that people learned what to do for the next rounds. And personally, I hope, I deeply hope that they don't see the next rounds and finish the whole job uh, on during these rounds and just uh you know finish the terror in the middle east i'm talking about the Ye yemen i'm talking about syria i'm talking about iraq i'm talking about uh, uh lebanon and so far even ukraine because as long as this regime exists it's going on and going on and it's just exporting its terror and its oil there's nothing else for the Iranian regime to export and well, that's the whole story about uh, the current round of protests in Iran. And uh, I believe that you have a limited time, as John mentioned and told me before. So I would, uh, well, I'll finish it here. If there were further uh, uh, podcasts and I was a guest, uh, well, we will talk uh, more about it.
Yeah, I, I think that's the best explanation I I think anyone could expect on the topic. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a complex situation, I think, as you demonstrated. Um, and, and one that probably won't be resolved in the way that a lot of people are rooting for. Um, on both sides, to, to be completely honest. Uh, this is the whole uh, thing that I... Uh had the proper time to talk about thank you for giving me the time to talk about the iran uh i know that your time is limited and uh well i think i occupied a little bit of your space right now but well uh i i deeply believe that this was something that uh was needed uh, to be talked about mm. and i will be happily talking about it further and further especially about the current protests uh I mean, if you were in my position, seeing all the names of the uh, uh, teenagers, the children, 11 years old, 12 years old, 16, 17, you would do the same thing for your nation, for your, uh, uh, you know, for your hometown, for your country as well. Well, uh, it's been years that I'm not living in Iran, but well, uh, my heart still beats for Iran, and I really uh, hope that the situation gets better for the Iranian people, and that would be the result of the uh, regime change, nothing else. I believe there is no reformism or nothing for the Iranian regime. There, the, 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 There is nothing else that can change these uh, Mullah regime, the Iranian regime, unless a regime change. No reformism, nothing. That's the whole thing. Thank you for listening, and thanks for having me, guys. It's always wonderful to have you. Yeah. And I, I think you made Excellent. a very important point about the lack of sort of response to what's been going on in Iran from the West. And I think that kind of leads quite helpfully into our next topic this evening, which is obviously North Korea, um, which has also largely had very little response from the West with their recent sort of misbehaviours. Um, and technical art, I'm sure you'll probably uh, have a little bit more information than I do, but obviously, uh, for those not aware, over the last sort of three weeks, we've seen a massive uptick in North Korean missile tests, um, which obviously has caused a great deal of alarm for the likes of Japan and South Korea, who very much feel as though they're in the firing line. Um, and we're now aware, of course, that North Korea is supposedly days away from a seventh nuclear warhead test um the, the the exact details of which remain to be seen um but it's another scenario that in light of what's been going on in ukraine and russia um hasn't really had as much sort of publicity and uh sort of outpouring of uh condemnation from the west as perhaps it has done in the past yeah, um, so I I think I, I I I haven't been following this as closely as I should. Um, so I, I can primarily speak to this on background at the moment. Um but, you know, internal pressures have obviously um brought some issues for the North Korean government. Um COVID didn't help. Um but there also is a sign that they're sort of trying to show that they're still still a relevant issue, mm. um, as the U.S. has been more focused on um, other situations, whether that be the Middle East or um, or the situation in Ukraine. Um, now, the Kim regime is obviously one that's very hard to look into, especially now that there are indications that um, uh, uh, Kim's sister, Kim Yo-jong, is handling external sort of relations or external decision-making when it comes to sort of the, the North Korean state apparatus. Um, though, again, a lot of that is unknown. A lot of that is palace intrigue that I, I just don't think we have access to and I don't think we'll ever have access to. Um, but I, I, I really do think there there is just sort of this level of, uh, of unknown when it comes to dealing with the North Korean government. Hmm. 
yeah, there's there really is just isn't that much I can say. Um, you know, they 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 demonstrated a missile, a, a, a usable missile that has a, a range that could be used to strike targets in um, uh, it various targets in the Pacific, say Guam. Um, I believe also the missile technically, if you had sort of flattened the range out and you know added a bit of padding um you know it, it could have hit targets um maybe as far as hawaii mm -hmm. um though though there is some some uncertainty to those actual capabilities um but yeah at the moment that that the, the north koreans appear to be demonstrating their their current missile capabilities yeah and we did see uh, as you mentioned a, a missile test where we saw a missile fly a range of around 4,000 kilometers um, in certainly a ballistic arc. Um, and we're also uh, sort of hearing confirmation from various sources that at least one of the recent missile tests was a submarine launched ballistic missile, um, which has obviously been sort of major concern for the West, um, particularly sort of two, three years ago. It was something that we knew was being developed um, and it was sort of one of those sort of milestones that would eventually come. Um, and obviously the, the, the thing with North Korea is that up until now, every missile test has been a land-based missile, which obviously, as you say, you know, South Korea, Japan, Guam have all sort of been in the firing line. But with obviously the advent now of a, of a working and, and capable submarine-launched ballistic missile and that capability it does now begin to sort of shift the the risk assessment slightly, I would imagine, for the US in particular, um, because to all intents and purposes, that, that submarine launch capability extends the range now that North Korea could strike should it choose to do so. Um, we've not heard an awful lot from Kim Jong-un himself recently. Um, there's not really been a, a huge number of sort of speeches or, or threats made. Um, he is very much sort of letting the tests and uh, worldwide perception of those tests do the talking. Um, but as, as, as we mentioned, it, it's another sort of developing situation on, on, in another part of the world that has very much been overshadowed um, by the conflict in Ukraine. Um, and s s something that really the, the rest of the world kind of ignores to their peril. Um, I think, obviously, as we mentioned, China as well in, in previous episodes, China's influence is growing quite significantly. Um, we've we've heard today um, from UK defence sources that a number of former RAF pilots, um, believed to be somewhere in the region of 30 or, or slightly more pilots, have now been employed by the Chinese government to train Chinese military uh, pilots in how to fight the West. And that, uh, you know, the, the, we could have a long discussion about that and how absolutely insane that entire story is. Um, but it's another example of the West at the moment is so focused on Ukraine that situations like this, which pose a massive risk to national and international security, are, are, are developing and, and have been developing for some time. And as I say, Granted, I, I do think this has come to the forefront in, you know, recent weeks, even as Ukraine has, has been a big focus. Um, this this definitely has become a focal point, at least in a lot of defense circles, um, where it is a worrying trend to see uh, private contractors like this um, go to China. Yeah, and it's, it, it's something that I, th I think has taken a lot in the UK by surprise because I don't think it's something we've sort of heard of before. But it's, it, it's, it is of concern. And, and as I say, the, the, the West kind of ignores incidents like this to their peril. Um, and, and obviously, you know, we're still seeing threats from Russia and, and, and it's right that the West is, is fairly focused right now on those threats and, and, and on the risk that is posed towards NATO and, and, and other alliances. Um, but as I say, it's it's something that will continue to emerge, particularly China, particularly North Korea's nuclear weapons. Um, you know, we, we've already touched on Iran and their sort of developing sort of spread and, and, and 
reach, uh, not just in terms of military equipment and so on, but also their sort of diplomatic reach to countries, you know, such as Venezuela and, and, and elsewhere. Um, and I think that kind of leads us on really to um, to Technical's favourite topic, uh, Ukraine. Um, and I, I think the last two weeks, we, we there's a lot to talk about really, isn't there? I mean... There's yeah, been, I mean, I think we already... I do think we already touched on it through the lens of Iran. Um, you know, obviously Iran is influencing a, a lot of the ongoing events right now in Ukraine. Their supply of weapon systems to the Russian government, which in and of itself is a damning indictment of the Russian defense production capabilities, um, has allowed the Russian government to conduct strikes against Ukrainian civil targets like power infrastructure and other... Um, other sort of assets that are, are are needed for the civilian population which seems to be a campaign in order to basically make ukraine unlivable sort of collapse the ukrainian economy and and and, and make it impossible for the ukrainians to fight on the home front um and that that is a problem for the ukrainians it, it, it's a huge one and i know a lot of people have the tendency to sort of write off a lot of russian gains or russian advances in any sort of um area as either propaganda or you know russian wishful thinking or or basically something else um though it is truly um sort of a threat for the uh, uh for the ukrainian government at the moment um iran has made it as we said earlier kind of clear um that they're going to be supplying ukraine with uh addition or russia with additional ballistic missiles um ones that like with the shofgar will have the capability to hit pretty much any target in Ukraine to, to a fair level of accuracy. Um, all right, okay, so on on the note, uh, uh, for those of you listening to the podcast, we might have just had a bit of a recording accident, so um, I, I may say things in a bit of an abbreviated way, but... Um, Iranian supplied drones and Iranian supplied assets have replaced the existing or or depleted stock of Russian cruise missiles and other long range assets. Um, I don't think there have been Russian caliber strikes for uh, weeks now. Uh, it's 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 at a very significantly declined um, uh, uh, rate. So we're very likely to see sort of this reduction and 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 this uh this lack of um of attacks um moving into the future these 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 strikes against ukrainian civilian targets uh, against civilian infrastructure especially power generation infrastructure um is aimed at disturbing the ability for the ukrainian home front to actually operate for for people to go around their daily lives in in kiev for the past few months before these resume these renewed strikes started people were effectively living a normal life um there there were you know wartime considerations but people were able to work people were able to sort of actually live and operate and russia's obviously with their new iranian supplied um drones their iranian supplied strike assets are attempting to disturb that and, and attempting to sort of end that normalcy um for the civilians in in ukraine um i expect that to continue and i expect them to especially if they acquire these ballistic missiles from iran um a, a, a strike targets um even deeper into ukraine and it'll be even harder for the ukrainians to actually counter it um which certainly is a threat um for the ukrainians that i i you know that they might be able to counter it they might not be able to counter it um right now their current air defense assets are able to counter a number of the drones and and various weapons that the russians are sending but again just due to the nature of um of 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 those swarming attacks and of those saturation attacks they they'll saturate you know any sort of um a, a integrated air defense network um which the ukrainians are trying to put together right now to you know protect against civilian targets um there are a lot more civilian targets in ukraine than military ones um and the russians will continue to sort of target them uh yeah that's my main notes from the past couple of weeks um it is is we'll continue to see those uh 
those major attacks against Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. Um, and we, we have seen them, obviously. Yeah, and I don't know if you mentioned in the last episode um, the attack on the Crimean Bridge, um, which has obviously caused quite a lot of discussion, uh, particularly in the OSIN community. I'm and, that with a 10 foot pole. It was a truck bomb. Field. Everyone shut up. Yeah, it, I, 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 think, I think the general <laughs> conclusion is it was a truck bomb. Um, no, no, no. no. <laughs> that's not the general conclusion. That's just that's just that's just what happened. Like yeah. there isn't, like like there's 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 CCTV footage of what happened. Like it's it's very easy to to see. It yeah. it was it was not Atticus. It was not the bridge disappeared. Yes. So we, we're pretty satisfied it was a truck bomb. Um, yeah. It it was not a ballistic missile. It was you know and 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 again like my question is why would the Russians lie about it being a ballistic missile? Like if if it was, they would be screaming about it, especially if it was something like a a NATO or US supplied weapon. They they would they would not shut up about it. And mm. and the truck bomb is is arguably an incredibly embarrassing occurrence for them they, it, their their security failed um yeah. yeah i i i just yeah this is sorry i not gonna not going to to elaborate on that too much um yeah, yeah that, that, I, that's, I, I that's, that's where we're at. that's where we're at with uh with that i think and um yeah with that, I think we will probably call it a day on the episode. Um, we just want to give a quick shout out to our uh, co-host uh, who, who couldn't be with us for this episode, um, Kyle, um, and just congratulate him uh, on the wedding. Um, yep. Congratulations, Kyle. Looks and, beautiful. Uh, with that, um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for listening. Um, we will be back in about two weeks' time for uh, episode nine. Uh, this has been the Ocean Bunker Podcast.